Hey everyone, welcome to episode number 10 of The Taste of Success. Today's guest is Dominique Wolf from The Wolf's Kitchen. How are you doing? I'm good, so good to be here. How are you? Yeah, very good, thanks. Thank you for jumping on. Um, you've had quite the, quite the week, really. I just saw you were in the Metro yesterday. I know, it's been a really good week. Um, I know that the Met, you know, people aren't commuting in the same way that they were, but it's still really great to get the press coverage. Um, and they did quite a little, you know, a good little feature, a um, picture of my sources and a picture of me. So yeah, a good start to the week. Perfect. So for anyone listening that hasn't come across yourself or your brand before, um, tell us a little bit about the Wolf's Kitchen and what is it that you actually sell? Right, so I launched um, a couple of months ago um, in June 2020, um, and um, at the moment it's a range of three spicy sauces. So there's a tamarind ketchup, a hot and sour sauce, and a jalapeno and lime. Mm. Um, and I've, you know, in the sort of, I think seven, eight weeks I've been going, I've got them into 13, I think, 13 or 14 independent, independents and delis. Um, 350 bottles of the tamarind ketchup also went out in a hot sauce subscription box this month. Um, I can't say which one it is because they've got an American uh, subscriber base as well. So they want to make sure everyone gets them first. So that was super exciting, just spreading, out the, spreading the brand out. Um, so yeah, I've been I'm doing lots of local deliveries as well. So it's been a really you know, busy couple of months, but a really great start to things. That's fantastic. Yeah, I had a, a look at the sources and the branding is um, exceptional. It's really, really nice, bright, vibrant. And I absolutely love spice and hot sauces. So all the flavours sound really, really interesting. Um, so why, why that particular range of sauces and spices? What's the story behind the sauce? So I'm half Thai um, and I've, all, I've grown up with sauces. I mean, literally, I was practically weaned on sweet chilli. I say this and it is actually almost true. My mum she would get a rotisserie chicken so she wouldn't even make it <laughs> she'd get the rotisserie chicken from cullen's which was a shop um uh, a while ago and um she would just literally bring out this bottle of sweet chili sauce a giant one um and in thailand the sweet chili sauces often have um pictures of chickens on because that's their for roasted chicken so we would just have that that would be our, our dinner sometimes <laughs> um so sauces has been a big it's just the way i eat even barbecue i mean barbecue sauces and any sauce i love sauce um and the, the story basically started off about nearly six years, of, years ago after my first son was born my aunt so her sister would come over and make us some food because newborn baby couldn't cook couldn't do anything um, and she would leave jars of sauces and this is where the sort of seed was planted and one of them was a tamarind sauce um, and so all we would have to do is grill a piece of salmon stir fry some veg and just pour the sauce on and we'd be like oh my we don't need to go out this is so amazing you know it was just delicious I hadn't really had those flavors before um so that sort of fast forward about two years and I came up with this other sort of product that my aunt was doing a, a delicious sprinkly thing couldn't even uh, don't even know how to describe it but um I actually took that to bread and jam the first, I think it was the first bread and jam um sat in front of the panel um I was kind of thinking about starting the business then but I was pregnant with a third child so I'd had three children three children in a short space of time. So put all plans on hold. Um, and sort of a year and a half ago, I had this kind of, oh, what do I want to do with my life? I was kind of feeling a bit in limbo um, as a you know, stay at home mom with, with no kind of career. And I remembered, oh, I wanted to do food. Why don't I look into that? And so then I decided I'm gonna do these sauces. Um, and instead of going straight into the sources, I actually decided to train at cookery school. So I went to Leith, um, which you, you probably know of it, and the gold standard of cookery schools, did a couple of professional courses there, um, started food writing, writing recipes for some um, a health and wellness site called Balance Garden. So they're all veggie and vegan recipes. I did that for nearly a year um, and my local um, cultural magazine called Village Raw. So really got just involved with that, did loads of networking and just thought, right, it's time now to, to do my sources. So in September, my child started school, got a couple, um, a few more days at nursery for the girls um, and gave myself a deadline of December. I'm gonna be in Ali Pali Farmer's Market with whatever the branding is, just with some sources. Um, I had the tamarind sauce, so I, I fine tuned that, I changed it, I adapted it. Um, and I knew I wanted something in the, not sweet chili, but something that was sweet, hot and spicy, but I didn't want sweet chili because as much as I love it, it, you know, it's been done to death and it's quite sweet. So I wanted something fresher and zingier. So I, I worked quite hard at a recipe developing that one, the hot and sour. And then the jalapeno and lime, I thought I wanted a green one. They do lots of green um, chili sauces in Thailand, but I just wanted something that was different to what was out there. Um, and I came up with the jalapeno and lime. So that's how those three flavors came about. 
Yeah, they all are singing praises to me because that's all my kind of spices. Tamarind is definitely a flavour that not many people, unless you've been to Asia, will have come across. Um, yeah. How would you describe it? So, like, if someone's like, oh, I've never really had tamarind before, like, how do you explain what your sauce tastes like without people tasting it? Yeah, it's, um, it's sweet and tangy, basically. Um, and this particular sauce has a hint of roasted chilli in it. And it's got, some people said it's got an element of that uh, barbecue sauce in it, that sweet and tanginess. Um, the actual fruit itself is in a sort of wooden type pod. Um, and it's got a sticky, almost date-like texture, but it's sort of sweet and tangy, basically. That's how I would describe it. Um, and it's, I mean, a lot of people will have had pad thai, and it is used in pad thai. So you'll have probably have had it without realising. But it's just, it just adds a depth of flavour. It's, it's a fantastic flavour, actually. Um, and it works really well with, I mean, I used to have it with the salmon, as I said, but great with grilled aubergines, you know, or barbecued aubergines and glazed on top of it, almost a bit like the miso sort of aubergine but it's kind of a, a different version of that um and great with just it's, it's so versatile people say i've had it with my cheese toasty or i had it with my dal i'd never have thought to have it with a dal but you know it kind of works on loads of different foods so yeah i think i've had tamarind chutneys and things like that yeah. before yeah um, so is there um with your sauces are you going to be looking to launch other flavors or is it going to be um similar products along that side of the line yeah, I've got ideas. I've got so many ideas. It's a question of where to take it because I've got lots of different sauce ideas. It may be that I go for the more cooking sauce, like stir fry sauces. Um, but then I've got ideas for other products that are maybe more snack based. So yeah. maybe that I go down that route. Um, the reason I call it the Wolf's Kitchen rather than the Wolf's Sauces, for example, is because I knew I wanted to really diversify, like, you know, e even not now at all, but doing something what you're doing. I hadn't ruled that out. Meal kits. Um, uh, sort of um, more red, not ready meals, but perhaps pots where you have the noodles and the rice, whatever, dehydrated. There's just a whole range of things I wouldn't rule out, even going into drinks or um, sweet foods later on. So, yeah, I'm keeping it open, but I've got, I'm just kind of working out what the best next stage is. So, I'm really, I'm really thinking about that. Amazing. It's always um, one of those things that when you're starting to grow and, and develop things, people are always like, what's next? What's next? Yeah. So, um, it's, also for yourself, balancing running a business and being a mum um, is not that common, it's becoming a little bit more common, um, but how have you found that, especially during lockdown? Yeah, it's been challenging. Um, I think, you know, in lockdown, I think the lack of childcare, even if I didn't have a business or another job, I think that has been a, it's been crazy, you know. Um, but my kids are young, they're three, four and five, the eldest is almost six, but they, it's just been, it's been a bit mental really. And especially at the height of lockdown, you know, there was this, I, I call it this brain fog and it was so true. I, I just, I'd be standing in the kitchen going, I don't know what I'm meant to do right now. I mean, it, it was just crazy. The, the washing's building up, the kids are screaming. Uh, I, I don't know who I am, can't, you know, I'm worried about getting a grocery shop. I was a bit obsessed by getting food at one point because I didn't want to go into a shop. Um, so, you know, yeah, all of that was challenging in its own right. And I think a lot of parents have found that. Um, and the business side of things, it actually, I find solace in it. it. For me, it's the sort of the light, the sort of something that I really get enjoyment out of. Um, so for me, it's worth, I, I'm so focused on it that it, it's that enjoyment. Um, I went away with the family, went on holiday, staycation recently, and my husband was able to take the kids out in the day. And I was like, yes, I can make some sales calls. Um, you know, genuinely really excited about doing stuff that maybe I wouldn't enjoy so much. <laughs> but yeah, I, so um, I think it just takes a lot of perseverance and focus. I think you've really got to want to do it because, you know, it's... I'm not perfect, so the house is a complete tip. I have to let something slip. I can't. I can't do everything. So, you know, the kids get a little bit neglected at times. A um, bit more TV than I'd probably like. You know, and I'm making phone calls while they're screaming. I was chatting to my distributor the other day, and I was, uh, you know, I was having a chat with him, and I was, I almost said I love you at the end of it because my kids were screaming so much, and I was just like, oh god, I just said I love you to my distributor. That's really embarrassing. Um, you know, you're trying to make a sales call and they're screaming. Yeah, so. It's, yeah, it's interesting, but it's a story and I'll look back on it and yeah, everything will be so much easier afterwards, so. I think it's, it is a fantastic story and it's gonna be inspirational to other people out there who kind of have it almost, not as an excuse, but as a reason to say, oh, I'll, I'll wait till this time. Um, it's with anything, it, there never seems to be the perfect time to launching anything. Um, it's that fear of starting. I know even with us launching, when we actually hit go on the website, it was, 9.30 at night on a random rainy November evening, we just went, 
so we launch and just kind of went for it. There was no real game plan. Everything had built up to it. Um, but as soon as it, it's in motion, then you're like, oh, actually, no, it is the right move. I can work around it and you, you adapt. Um, yeah. So moving back to the food side, um, so you said um, you're half Thai. Um, I assume you've been out to Thailand and, and eaten out there? Yes, um, I haven't been. I didn't live there. I wasn't brought up there. And I've been there probably four times in adult life, something like that. Um, and I, I mean, I love it there. Um, I do have Thai family um, and then normally they'll take us out for one sort of meal there and it's quite, they are feeders. I mean, they really are feeders. So I think they took us out on the last day and I went out, we went out to a, a market in the day. So they were buying all sorts of things and we were quite full, but then we had dinner planned at six with the rest of the family and you've ne- they'd already ordered the food. So they order the food. So you get on and the table is covered in food and you just think, I've only just eaten. Um, but it's amazing food. And then they start putting it on your plate. And you're like, oh my goodness. And they're not even eating, they're all watching you eat. <laughs> so you take a few mouthfuls and they say, do you like it? And you say, oh, it's lovely. And then they put more on. You're like, no, no, I haven't even finished the rest of the food. So uh, it's kind of like this most amazing experience, but you come away feeling like you've been attacked by food. Um, but the smells, I mean, when you go, go there, I mean, even one of the best meals we had was, I think, years ago when we went um, and we stayed in the hotel, you know, mid- and we ordered some Tom Yum soup. It was just so real and authentic authentic whatever that word means but um but i think these days it is it can be hard to find the authentic food because you're on the sort of staying in um, a more touristy area and they really do kind of change the food a bit and, and reduce the spices um and we made the mistake the last trip we went to kotao and uh it's a backpackers haven and loads of cool restaurants there and we made the mistake of saying i think uh pepetka you know i like spice or, or something and they just obviously took piss they thought who are these who are these pretenders and they put like 50 chilies in this panang and we're like oh this is this is spicy but it's fine we asked for spicy <laughs> so yeah <laughs> Yes, we had the same experience in Thailand where it's like our ped ped or something like wanting it spicy and they kind of look at you you're like you're white you're British you you haven't got a spicy palate and they would come out of the kitchen like watching they were like is he eating it and I'm just like yeah it's all right it's not that spicy um so yeah we absolutely love Asian food um have you been anywhere else in Asia um and had um, food there where have I? I've been to India which is um South India and the food there again was really fantastic um, much when I say better than you know it wasn't it was very light actually and Kerala the food was was fantastic um, and I love I love eating out I mean as in street food um, so we had some of that there but uh, mainly Thailand in Asia actually but I mean Mexico not in Asia at all but I remember you said Mexico as well and the food in Mexico is amazing I think I was only there for a couple of weeks but I sometimes had two lunches and two dinners it'd be like you'd had lunch and you'd walk past somewhere else and I have to try that. It doesn't matter if we put on a stone in the next week, but we have to eat this food. So, uh, God, Mexico's one place we haven't visited, but I am so, so keen to go there. I'm actually doing a Mexican um, night at somewhere called Fresh to Desk next week. Um, so this will be, we would have done it by the time this podcast actually comes out. But yeah, we're doing um, a Mexican themed kind of plant-based week for the kind of eat out to help out scheme. Um, so I'm really excited because I, I just think Mexican food is such fun food. It's a really good, if, if we're ever having like friends around, we're like, let's just do a big chili, let's do nachos, guacamole, salsa, we can do tortillas, like whatever it is. Um, there's just so much passion around food. Is there any particular um, cuisine or food or ingredient that you are absolutely obsessed with and is your go-to favourite? Oh, I mean, go-to food is a general thing, is Asian food, obviously. Um, not obviously. I mean, my mum didn't really t- teach me to cook that much, but it's just the flavours. So I would, we'd probably have rice and noodles three or four times a week. So that's, a, and then Mexico would be my second go-to. So um, j- just things, uh, I mean, I'm, as you know, half Thai, but I don't actually make a Thai curry paste. I've always bought them. It's just kind of my cheat. Um, Maple is a great brand, and it's just really easy to to make up a curry so you know oh what shall I have it's Monday night oh I'll just have a bit of red curry you know it's kind of like that's our basic that's our midweek kind of food um or very stir fries of, of many you know noodles or whatever um so it's just because that's easy and it's flavors I like I mean I crave those spicy flavor zingy flavors kind of what I love um I also love the pungency in Thai food mm-hmm. you know it's it's this, that sort of rich um richness that you get um but mexican again it's got that spice that zinc the lime the garlic chilies um so yeah and i always have sauce on all my mexican food it's got various sauces on it of course 
Where do you think your um, real passion for food started? Was it from, as you said, your your mum and your nan's sauces? Um, do you think it was as young as that? Or when was um, it you started cooking going, oh, I really enjoy actually being in the kitchen and cooking? Yeah, so um, definitely, I was also brought up in the Middle East. So I lived there till I was nearly nine. So just surrounded by, you know, we used to go to an Indian restaurant all the time. So it's just always surrounded by those flavours. Um, I. I did actually live with my dad from when I was about 10. My parents divorced, lived with my dad. Um, he, his food was uh, chicken kiefs, uh, oven chips. Uh, <laughs> Smash was a favorite in the household and baked beans. I think the only vegetable we had was baked beans actually um, when I was a kid. Uh, I, I then started getting into cooking. I was going, you know, he, he likes his health food fad. So we do the odd health food fad, but it's like Ooh, brown rice, stir fry with broccoli. It just wasn't happening. But I did slowly get into cooking and uh, actually when I'm, met my husband when uh, we were in our 20s we sort of went on that journey together and we loved we loved going to restaurants and we loved eating out and traveling you know san sebastian the food have you been to san sebastian um it's the most amazing uh, you know i hope one day i'll be able to go there and it'd be safe and happy and all this pinchos it's just you know so love of food came from that and and also my grandmother on the other side she's she was dutch um and she she loved her food as well so um she was always she had a sweet tooth so she'd buy these marzipan cakes and always sweet treats so definitely it's a combination really um but i went on that exploratory journey in my 20s really so yeah um my, i didn't learn it in the kitchen with my mom but sort of afterwards did you have any um terrible food memories that stuck with you from either a young age or where you were introduced a food or, or product and went i'm never eating that again or i really didn't enjoy that um well it's thing in um i think we went to italy once and there was some form of pressed codro that was challenging shall we say <laughs> um kind of yeah i mean my husband was almost yeah doing that but the woman who owned the it was in this little someone's living room base and she kept on coming over so you sort of had to eat it and swallow it down so that was a, a little bit challenging um generally i lots of foods i didn't like i do like now there is one food and this is a very controversial food to not actually enjoy it, and it's olive oil in a kind of the more virgin kind of in a raw state so fine to cook with it but if it's sort of just on a salad or just drizzled over it i would that would be a challenge for me and i don't know why i love olives um, it's probably the texture of oil. So, so, but you know, if you go to Greece and you order a salad and it's heavy in the oil, I just add some vinegar on the side to sort of douse it down a bit. So I've kind of worked out a strategy for for coping with that. But it's not very chefy of me to to not like my olive oil. I'm trying. I keep on trying to like it. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, opposite of Jamie Oliver, which is olive oil with everything. I know, and I love Jamie. I really love Jamie Oliver. But every time I look at it, I'm like, no. <laughs> My husband does it as well. I might make a risotto and he's pouring the oil on. I'm like, why are you that? Um, so yeah, but that, that's a minor thing overall. I'm probably particular about my food, but less, I, I don't knock out any food groups, you know. So. Is it just olive oil or is it all oils? Because we um, kind of went through a stage of being obsessed with avocado oil or hemp oil, just again, different fats and, and absolutely delicious as an oil. I haven't actually tried those, um, so I don't. I think I probably would struggle with those in the same context. But for example, sesame oil, if it's if I don't use too much of it, and it, I think it's a textural thing for me. I don't like greasy food particularly, although I love tempura. You know, I wouldn't fry it myself because I know I don't fry food, but I'll have lots of tempura if I'm in a Japanese restaurant. So go figure. Um, but yeah, sesame oil, I like the flavour of that, and I think it does add something. Um, so I'm open to. I'm not. I haven't closed. I you know I still. I, I've heard that the more you try something, the more you get familiar with it. Um, it was like that with butter. Weirdly, I never liked butter in my sandwiches as a kid. I still don't, but if I have nice butter and nice bread, I've made myself over time like that. So I will actually actively eat that. <laughs> but yeah, just not in sandwiches, so. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. Um, I, I'm also going back to your sauces. People who know me and the way I eat, I have sauce with absolutely everything. Um, there used to be ongoing jokes. Whenever I'd make a meal, I would just finish it with a drizzle of some kind of sauce. Um, and it would generally always be sauce and chili flakes. So something like sriracha and loads of chili flakes. That that would be any dish. It didn't matter what it was. It was like a sandwich, chili set, um, chili sauce and flakes. Um, is there any sauces that other than your um, 
ones that your family would make that you would always buy as a go-to until you kind of created your range and go, yep, yeah, now I've got yeah, this. Yeah. I mean, I've got, I love sauce, as you know, so I've got hundreds of bottles in the fridge. Um, Tabasco is, is my, I mean, whenever I go out for pizza, and I often forget my Tabasco, so after I went to the shop, I just get up and my husband knows where I'm going. He knows I'm popping down to the local corner shop to buy some more Tabasco. I love Tabasco on pizza. That's, that is my favourite things. And with lots of other sort of things as well. Um, I was always buying the Ancona hot sauce. Um, yeah. um, until I came up, I now use my jalapeno and lime instead of that one, actually. Um, but that is what, that used to be my sort of go-to. Um, and I mean, I used to buy sweet chilies, but once you make your own sweet, just sweet chilies, really they're so much nicer than the shop bought ones because mm. they always taste just a bit um corn floury or starch or just something not quite right about a bit gloopy so um used to be sweet chili um and but i love things like hoisin sauce so they are great in a stir fry you know you can make lots of things with um hoisin sauce um, an oyster sauce um which you look at the back of it and it makes you slightly sick because it's full of the most well full of lots of stuff really mm. so um those are sources that I would use. I mean, I do still use oyster sauce. I pretend, I, I turn a blind eye to what, what's on the back of the label, but I use oyster sauce frequently as well. But table, I mean, ketchup, so you get me started now. Um, if I have a burger, it is a bit sad because I use half a bottle of ketchup on it. And, yeah. you know, and my hat, I'm just filthy. Everything's filthy, but I can't help it. I, I love sauce. <laughs> it's got to be the burger has to be the burger mayo ketchup combo like with pickles yeah. you can't you can't do yeah, it like that i've got to have pickles i mean we get for a jar a big jar of pickles a week in this household but i love pickles so yeah that, that would be my combination i did start making one i found in olive magazine which is a burger sauce recipe so it yeah. basically has those ingredients but you mix it up <laughs> first with juice some pickle juice and some some finely chopped onion um so that's also delicious but also have to have ketchup on the side too <laughs> of course um so when, when you actually launch your sources, you're saying you're in about 14 stores now. Um, to anyone listening who maybe has a brand or working on a brand or looking to get it stocked in places, do you have any tips or advice on what works for you to get stocked in these stores? Um, well, I started off locally. So um, I, what I actually did is I created a networking group about a year and a half, with two networking groups in my area, actually. So one was a women's networking group and one was for food people. Um, and... So I, and I did that because I wanted to network, but I didn't always want to go into London to do that. And I wanted somewhere locally. Um, and so in those networks, that's really helped as well. So I kind of had uh, sort of people in the area who were already supporting what I was doing. Um, some, so one of the pubs, um, which was my first stockist, the Maynard in Crouch End, um, I used to host my networking meetings there. And they actually asked me, they, they asked me for my sources because they were turning into a daily briefly over lockdown. Um, and I sold out there, I sold 42 bottles. Doesn't sound a lot, but 42 bottles of sauce in a week is actually a lot. Um, mm -hmm. so I think a normal rate of sale is about four a week. Um, so we sold out within a week in that place. So I just started going to local places, which is basically the answer to that. Um, just, just really so, just... I think people love the idea of you buy, you know, a local person, a local mom has started their business and then you can get the support from there. Um, I was sort of uh, posting on my local Facebook group. So again, that helped drive people to those shops. Um, and then as I was sort of able to then say, okay, well, I've got three delis, four delis, it perks, um, it, it draws the attention of, of the other shops that you're approaching. Um, um, I, my initial plan was to go in in person, but actually that didn't work out because it was locked down. Um, and also with the kids in tow, just not possible. I, I did take them to one deli meeting actually, um, and they were sort of having their snack because it was the only way I could bribe them in. And lockdown, you know, it was, it was still happening and they, they were threatening to smear peanut butter all over the place. I was like, oh God, let's get out of here. Don't touch it. Um, the deli owner was fine. Maybe he was endeared. I'm not sure. He did. He did put an order in, so um, it didn't go wrong. Um, but I think my I, ideally, I'd go in to, to have more meetings. But at the moment, it's just not viable with the childcare. So I, I call places up. I send emails. Um, I'm still fine tuning how I approach people. So um, it, yeah, and so now now I've got fulfilment sorted out. So I was actually delivering myself um, locally, but that actually takes longer than you think. You think, oh, I'll just pop into Crouch End and deliver some sources but that's an hour round trip by the time you've parked and dragged a heavy trolley up the road um so um but just start is the advice basically go for it start in your local area and and go from there yeah great advice there um i completely agree especially with the the starting local like we're not in many stores we're in a couple of local health food stores and that's that's kind of good for now our, our model is direct to consumer we've got that and 
um, as I said before we jumped on this call, we're actually speaking to other brands about potentially working together to work on the distribution. Um, so as you said, you're in um, a hot sauce subscription box, but can people buy from you directly? Yes, yeah, my website's up and running now. Um, so that's just started. I, before it was up and running, I was on another website called Gifted Local, which um, great concept of, of putting together local people in the local community who are artists and creatives. Um, and also they had a food section. So I was able to um, sell through that um, locally and deliver locally. So there was a nice element of kind of no packaging and no delivery to that. Uh, but now my website's up and running. So that's great. And definitely online is an, definitely, an, I haven't even touched it really, but there's a lot of places, Etsy, somewhere on Amazon, of course. Um, so the there's a lot of uh, places that I want to start approaching when I have the time. Borough Box is another one as well. So. Yes, yeah, I've heard people talk about Borough Box. Um, they seem to have some really nice independent brands and they've got a really good reputation. Um, so, yeah, that's a, that's a great shout out. Um, is there any particular stores that you're set on getting into? Well, I would love Selfridges. I think um, probably most foodpreneurs have that high on their list. So, yeah, that is... Um, that is a target. Um, I'm, I'm writing my presentation as we speak. I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> so hopefully I'll be able to run it by a couple of people who have experienced that journey, but they are definitely on my list for this year. Um, one thing I think when you start off as a foodpreneur, you think, oh, I'm gonna be in the shop, you know, all the main supermarkets, but you realize as you start off your business plan that it's not necessarily viable to start off that way. So my plan has to be has been start small, start local, a sort of a plan of minimal investment, if you like, proving the concept, doing locally, and then extending out from there. Um, so yeah, smaller independence, and then some of the bigger kind of farm shops I have a distributor. So hopefully we'll be able to sort of increase the reach um, moving forward. So yeah, all, all going in the right direction though. And um, as you said as well, you've, so you've got a distributor and a, is it a producer for your source now as well? Yeah, I've got a manufacturer. I had planned initially, um, I went before I did the farmer's market, um, I was thinking I'm going to do it myself. And I actually went to a food scientist and we had a development day. And then I came back and realized this is not going to work. How am I going to do this uh, with three kids? Uh, no, it, yeah, I realized very quickly and I started calling around. It was a simple thing like, oh, I'll get some chilies. And I couldn't even source chilies in bulk. I mean, obviously, maybe I was making the wrong phone calls, but I don't need 100 kilos of the stuff, you know, speaking to wholesale, wholesalers on it. Um, but I don't want to go to Sainsbury's to buy little packets of chilies, which is what I was doing in the test phase. So, um, and then I came across this small manufacturer and we were able to turn it around really quickly and get the product ready for that first sort of farmer's market in December. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just enabled me to scale up to, to the next kind of level quite quickly. I'm always interested with people working with manufacturers to the process from your initial recipe to the one that they make now. Um, was there much that you had to kind of have leeway on or was it pretty much actually, no, that's, it's a better source now and it's, it's more refined and we've got it to where I want it to be. Um, so with the two of the sources, the hot and sour and the jalapeno and lye, they were very, you know, spot on to how I had them. There was some, definitely some amendments with the recipes that they, that they know and they deal with, you know, green peppers added, is uh, to the chilies for example to temper the heat um and they and things like i'd put in my recipe for jalapeno and i'm going to saute the onions till they're brown and add it at this stage and they just chuck it all in at the same at the beginning i'm like oh, how's that gonna work um you know and i they're fine finally dicing my onions and ch then chucking l large bits in and actually it's just the, the process is different so you have to kind of accept that um the tamarind did initially on the uh, sort of test day come out quite different because my tamarind concentrate was different to their tamarind concentrate so I was a bit like oh my goodness this was the key recipe and it's different so I went home that weekend and did 15 batches of with their product to, to get, it, get it right you know a bit more onion a bit more this and that and actually got it to the point I was really happy with so there is fine tuning definitely but I was on a really you know what you were saying just go for it and do it and that has been my motto just start before you're ready and just do it um, and I, so I have raced things through a bit, but they've not, it's, it's been great and it has happened to work out. And I think sources are not like, you know, but, uh, you interviewed Jess the other week with uh, banana scoops and it's not like that. You don't have that kind of scientific sort of issue to it. Um, it's a straightforward product in many ways, you know, it's, it's got a great low pH, so it's, it's stable and it lasts a long time. So I'm very lucky that it's an easier source to kind of manufacture in the first instance. Yeah, no, and um, as we said, 
everyone loves sauces and the branding is also something that's um, very bright and vibrant with yours and looks fantastic. So is the branding something that you've worked on yourself or have you worked with like designers? Um, yeah, so I um, basically I had gone through a whole process of um, speaking to 10, if not more agencies. And I was almost going to spend quite a few thousand pounds on going with an agency. And, you know, they're a great agency and I'm still in contact with them today. We may still work together in the future. But obviously, as a startup, you think how many bottles have you got to sell to make that worth it? When you look at it in those terms, you're not making that much for bottles. I mean, sometimes it's pence by the time you've gone through a distributor and you've paid your uh, delivery charge. It's not as much at all. Um, and you think, God, I've got to sell a lot of bottles to even recoup that. Um, and actually, a friend of mine, um, also with three kids, sort of got in touch and said, oh, I'd, I'd really like to, um, um, to, 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 to work on my portfolio and do it for free. And um, she offered, and it was like, wow, amazing. Um, and um, we, we worked together and she has a copywriter friend who actually has, they've worked in agencies together and just, um, she was excellent. So she helped with the tone of voice. I had the idea, I came up with a sort of avatar, if you like, and the sort of um, concept. And really, I, you know, I knew what I wanted the product to be like, but I wasn't able to sort of put that into words. The copywriter really helped with that tone of voice. Um, would definitely recommend getting that if you're even stuck, because I think it makes a big difference. And um, Lisa, the designer, we came up with the design and um, you might have, seen uh, written about this that um actually i had the design all ready to go for april this was my launch date um and lockdown happened so we put it on hold and um we'd had a test um label printed and it, something wasn't right about it and you know we had it for a few weeks and lockdown was still going on and i was looking at it going god i'm just not sure i like it anymore and lisa at the same time i hadn't said anything to her and she came back and said look i'm not sure about this and she came up with a whole new different design. Um, Seal had the wolf motif, but it was completely different. And it was like, this is really so much better. Um, it, yeah, it, it was so much better. So actually for me, there was this silver lining of, of lockdown giving the chance to have a pause and go, right, um, we can make this better. So, and everyone, you know, um, uh, people have been very positive to the way that the branding is now. So I'm really happy that it's turned out this way. Fantastic. Yeah, it's... With um, lockdown, I think a lot of people, it, it forced their hands to either diversify and, and go a different direction. Um, so even with me doing this podcast, this was just like a, a fun side project. I was like, well, I want to be doing this in person. But for now, Zoom podcasts are becoming much more acceptable because that's the way that everyone's having conversation. So, um, yeah, it, it's just the right to get on with it. But it's also allowed people to discover new avenues for business, either going direct to consumer or creating new products or new services mm -hmm. that are kind of additions or maybe even now bigger than their business. Um, yeah. So I think it's been a really interesting period. Obviously some people it's completely halted if you've got a restaurant or somewhere like I hope they're starting to now get back into it and, and really work on that. Um, but it's really interesting to see, as you said, how people have pivoted and, and grown with it. Mm. Yeah. So, um, I won't keep you too much longer because I imagine with the, the kids and everything, we need to make sure you're not <laughs> not away from them too long. <laughs> well, they're, they're out with their grandma, so I'm very excited to have the house. Well, I'll say to myself, my husband's in the loft, <laughs> locked away there, but yeah, making some sales calls. <laughs> Amazing. Well, before I ask the final question, um, again, where, where can people find you, speak to you if they have any questions or want to actually purchase some of your sources? Um, so it's thewolfskitchen.com and that's two O's. Um, so yeah, the animal book two O's. Um, and um, the same, it's the Wolf's Kitchen on Instagram and Facebook as well. Lovely. Um, well, again, thank you so much for your time. And the final question, um, you've lived out your long life, you've achieved everything you've wanted with your sources and everything else. And it's your final meal before you move on to whatever your next chapter would be. What would you go for? I would, um, so I'd have to have some champagne, ice cold, um, with some mini cheddars, because I do love mini cheddars. That is a little bit of mine. Mini cheddars with some champagne. That's just to start with, though. Um, <laughs> then I would be really greedy because this is my last meal. So I would have a combination of Mexican street food, um, some amazing tacos, and I would also have some Thai street food. <laughs> Hedging my bets here. Um, I do love a good... Um, uh, mooping they're called I don't know if I pronounce it right but it's kind of like a pork skew I'd have I just I'd really go for it on the street food and to finish I would have something really chocolatey um because I love chocolate um but also I'd have um ice cream a really good gelato something with a salted caramel swirl in it as well I'd just go for it because I think there's nothing wrong with having two of everything you know if you can <laughs> have the choice 
hey, if it's your last meal, you, you get whatever you want. Go yeah. for it. Okay, I want calories to see me through the other side. <laughs> um, just quickly, actually, so you said about um, desserts and having a sauce. Is there going to be a dessert sauce range? Is that something you're considering? Oh, uh, it could absolutely be. I mean, I, I was making some, I, oh, it's in the news, just in case I decide to do it. But there's, I mean, I have got a real sweet tooth. I love, um, I love sweet things. So definitely, I think the ethos of the Wolf's Kitchen is it's about flavour. It's about exciting flavour. So that can really incorporate anything. <laughs> so yeah, uh, sweets could be the thing. I think, in the, I think before then, um, it may be in the snacking sort of realm, uh, basically. So uh, watch this space and we will see what I come up with. <laughs> Yeah, watch this space in need. Well, um, yeah, thank you so much for today. It's been lovely to get to know you and um, go check out Dominique's amazing range of sources and get involved. So, thank you so much. and uh, have a great rest of the week. You too. See you later. Cheers. Bye bye.